I would like to, and today I will stop according to your uh, wise advice. And I have to remind one thing, because yesterday when I said I was very happy to be here, which is that way too, I totally forgot to formally thank my friend John, which I do now. Uh, and I really enjoy my time here. So before I go over to the next lecture, there is some real <coughs> leftover from yesterday, but even before I do that, I would like to uh, pick up questions regarding any obscurity or something that you would like to be rewound from the yesterday lecture. I don't need to complete my program. There is no point in doing that. But what I'm saying, I'd like to be clear to everyone. So if there is anything we should go over again, just let me know. I was crystal clear. Good to know. No? Yeah. Well, are, you, are you going to... Uh, today? Re, re, well, are you going to be... Sum, are you going to summarize what I mean, yesterday you did? told us about lattice gases and you told us the problems with lattice gases yeah. and then you developed a, uh, the uh, hierarchy of LB methods. Uh, yes, yes. So we should probably recap from there uh, because um, today what the, the, the content of the lecture will be the second generation. Uh, here I have the Jurassic of Marcus Boltzmann and, and today I will give some there is to give some ideas on the development which came later, but, but which are relevant enough to, to deserve being discussed. Um, so why don't we get exactly how long the line suggested by John? I will pick up this one. This one. Okay? Uh, so let's go with this item. This is really summary. So we started from what is gas cyber automata. Uh, which is potentially a revolutionary game to do for dynamics, the revolution being mostly attached to this work. It's exact computing. Exact means that once you put your model in the computer, the computer does not uh, introduce any further error. All the error is eventually in the model, but not in the way you process the model, because zero is zero, one is one. Boolean computing is wonderful. And think of the system we have at hand. It's turbulence, hydrolinear, uh, dynamical system, which in the long run, if you do a long time simulation, would suffer heavily of round-off errors. I mean, round-off errors are not a joke. It's a serious concern for uh, non-linear dynamical systems. So in that respect, people got really excited, and deservedly so, because that would have been Besides the revolution, there, was some, there were some evolutionary effects which are important nonetheless. The dynamics, the stream and collide dynamics I showed you yesterday, the particles just hopping, and when they hop, they mix according to the collision rule, is simple enough. Although this is kind of double-edged, because it is simple in 3D, but I showed you that when you go to 3D and you insist on the boot and gain, then simple is not really an appropriate word because each and every single collision would take you 48 megabytes of storage, <coughs> which at the time was just outrageous, but even today people will not settle for a scheme which takes 48 megabytes uh, uh, per, per lucky size. This is a bonus which in the end, in my opinion, is the most basic reason why all this machinery is going to stay for the future. Uh, lattice gas were excellent for power computing. Lattice both when you can Google through and any architecture you, you use will restitute basically in a speed up. In fact, I could have given a talk instead of terminals on hemodynamics. We recently, uh, just a few months ago, uh, uh, competed for the Gordon Bell Award. You know, you know what the Gordon Bell Award is a major supercomputing application worldwide. And the application was in uh, blood flow with the U in the human arteries, real data from, from the Harvard Medical School. And the code delivered 0.7 petaflop, which is uh, uh, gigas 9, hex is 12, is basically 10 to the power 15 operation, floating point operation per second, with linear speed up over more than 2 million GPU cores. It was really a huge run. The machine was in Japan. But just to mention that, 
I don't know any other method which would have such a linear speed up over a little job. So this thing is extremely important. And for the application, mostly for engineering application, the fact that the paradigm is really simple. The paradigm is simple. The, the implementation might be not, but the paradigm is very simple. Just move freely and collide. Okay? Uh, the information, as I said yesterday, I will never emphasize this enough. Instead of u grad u, which is, means move my velocity along my trajectory, and the trajectory gets wide in a turbulent flow, here you always move the information along a straight line. No matter how complex the underlying space time dynamics is, this is an enormous <coughs> And besides turbulence, it also gives you an easy end if you have a complex geometry such as power speed. Basically, I would say the flows in porous medium is a heterogeneous chemical reaction, and things like this are just perfect field application for lattice balls. It's a slow flow, and I told you yesterday why it has to be slow. And dealing with grossly regular geometry is just perfect for lattice balls. So, this was lost in the process of going from lattice gas to lattice balls, not because we pre average, so bits become real numbers. But, happily enough, the other bonuses, which are no, not minor, I mean, they are perhaps not revolutionary, but they are pretty solid, they, fortunately enough, they stay with us. So the lattice Boltzmann is generating all of the, all of the things. Excuse me? Uh, could you think of a way to have the occupation numbers in a discretized way to yes. stay with integer arithmetic? Or? Very good point. Uh, some people, including John Lewis, is a negative. People who put out the first lattice ball from the nonlinear, he was very much keen on that. And then just doing integer lattice balls. Um, why we didn't do that? I don't have, don't have any solid answer to that, except for the fact that floating point comes by so easily mm -hmm. that everybody's using that. But I think it would still be a good idea. I don't know whether you really have enough. Um, smoothness in your data if you process a signature. So it has not been successful as an idea. I, I can't tell you why. But in principle, yeah, you're right. Uh, well, you have much less resolution, of course, because this, uh, even with 64 bits, you still have. I mean, the, the spacing between the various integers is much less uh, accurate than floating point. So I'm not so sure that this would work for, it has less flexibility. But it would be exactly right. Now, uh, as I said, unfortunately, the rings by Frisch, of Lapin, and Pomo went kind of shattered against these rocks and explained you basically the four reasons. Reason number one, and historically this was how Lattice Boltzmann came into uh, light, because since you're dealing with good and number, but you want to see some flow, some smoothness in the flow, you have to do a lot of average. And Zanetti McNamara realized that the Lattice Boltzmann, by definition, would have no noise, and why not using that? Okay? So that's how the Lattice Boltzmann is born, first member of the family. But the other problem, particularly the complexity in 3D, was just left the same. Instead of having <coughs> 2 to the power 24 uh, Boolean operation, you have 2 to the power 24 floating point. That's not really enough <coughs> at all for being competitive in the computation of the dynamics market. Uh, and as I said yesterday, even though from the outside people don't appreciate that, but that's the real thing. In between, uh, we saw that after Zanetti McNamara comes Higuera Jimenez, and there is a little interesting another historical anecdote. The paper by Zanetti McNamara, which deservedly so gets a lot of citation, was submitted at the same time as the paper by Higuera Jimenez, who gets Many less, say, a factor of three less, basically. But they were both submitted to PRL at the same time, except that one made it through and the other didn't. So just to say that sometimes a little details in the history makes a relatively huge difference. 
most papers are extremely well known, but this one is uh, well, mu much more reasonable. So what they did, in fact, they could uh, uh, cast, in fact, the compass <coughs> region operator in the form of the matrix vector product, so a matrix form, uh, leveraging the thing that I insisted a lot yesterday upon, which is that you're looking at the theory, but you always want to look at the theory close enough to equilibrium. And this equilibrium for reasons which are really rooted into the lattice has to be a slow flow of the So kinetic theory does not need to be dealing with a slow flow as long as you are not far from a natural distribution. Okay? The maximum distribution can be shifted a lot in velocity space. You can move fast, but you cannot depart from the Maxwell chain. In the lattice, you have a further constraint that the flow has to be slow because otherwise you would realize that you are in a lattice and not in a, in a continuum. So by leveraging this asymptotic limit, they could cast this uh, unmanageable collision operator into a very manageable form, but this form was still derived from the collision operator of the lattice gas. And as a result, there was no chance that you could do just one single collision that was not contained in the original operator. And as I told you yesterday, since you are in a cage, many collisions are just prohibited by the conservation laws. Okay? So the result is that particles travel too much before they meet. So momentum is diffusing too much. The diffusivity is high. Diffusivity of momentum is viscosity. High viscosity means low energy. And again, no big deal for the hardcore fluid dynamic people. Then comes Sigera and, and then and, and our contribution as well, uh, when we realized that by breaking this link with the lattice, underlying lattice gas, you can, instead of derive the collision uh, operator, design it with the proper symmetries so that you're guaranteed that you recover not distortion that in the large scale. By then, the mean free path is an input parameter, basically. And in principle, maybe that's what we thought back then, uh, uh, you can bring your viscosity down to zero, which, of course, the lattice would not allow you. But the point is that you can make the Reynolds number as high as the grid will allow. So at that point, you are really on a par with any other numerical method, <coughs> except that you still have all these rules. So when I hear that Lattice Boltzmann is yet another final different scheme, uh, I get a little slightly annoyed because it is really not. I mean, in the end, it is a final different scheme, but the story behind is very different, and the bonuses you get are very peculiar. You will not get the same from just yet another final different scheme. And the anomalies we didn't cover, we didn't need to bother about that. So these are the basic three points. So, uh, So these are the four Jurassic lattice Boltzmann, and as you see, the things develop pretty fast. Actually, this, this is developed in a matter of less than a year. Uh, this was 88, this was, the Gary Manage was again 88, but published in 89, so I should write 88. So, uh, and our uh, scattered matrix in, in uh, uh, Free from Lattice Gas Constraint came just a few months later, and in fact, it was published earlier than that. So this people deserves more credit. And the diagonal matrix came just a couple of years later. So we didn't have much time to use the scattering matrix because as soon as these appeared, everybody could jump onto the uh, single uh, time relaxation. Okay, so that is more or less the story. And uh, with this story, uh, we can now, we don't need to go over any further detail. I think one, one thing I would like to show you, yeah, just, I mean, just, just to take it easy, the kind of application that you can run. This is a very beautiful work by, this is a, a collaboration between Finland and Holland, if I'm not mistaken. Jesse Timonen is in Chivasky, if I'm not mistaken, and these people are in Amsterdam. This is the perfect application for that. So what they do, they took some experimental scan of the NMR of them. This is paper, piece of paper. So these are fibers. So they, they uh, digitize 
the geom microgeometry, and what they do, they just, very simple, they just put the gradient across the sample, and they compute the flow across the sample as a function of the gradient, so they measure the permeability from, I would say, first principles, because they really take into account uh, all the micro details of the geometry. So this is a way of deriving the permeability of the microscopic sample of paper uh, out of the explicit, explicit solution of, of the, the <coughs> uh, Eventually, if you would have, say, some chemical reaction just on the surface chemical reaction, some catalysis and things, then that would be a piece of cake because that would be a local chemical reaction normally are localized. So it would be very easy, in fact, to augment this calculation with some heterogeneous uh, catalysis effect. So this application, if you have something like that, just go for it. It would be perfect for you. Okay? So chemical engineering is generally general the, the, the area where this type of... Uh, for geophysical purposes, things are much more complicated because this sample is small. And then if you want to extend and the permeability, in fact, depends on the scale of the... So extending this, we did the very first simulation of polymedia back in 1999 with Dan Rotman, you might know him, at MIT. He, he was contributing a lot of significant stuff, uh, stuff in the early days. And I remember that he always taught me how the real challenge is to bring these on scales where you see the heterogeneity. In fact, the multi-scale nature of permeability, and I have not seen that. Uh, well, I'm not, of course, following all the developments from Lapis Bolt, that would be impossible, but I think this problem is very well. So computing the uh, small sample uh, uh, for, out of first principle is perfect, but then moving this information on a larger scale is another capital of fish. Okay, uh, another application, which is just as extreme opposite, is that's the talk I'm giving today with people text. This is hardcore stuff. Uh, this is uh, aerodynamic design, turbulence modeling, and uh, I see no way you can do such a calculation on, on the standard academic group because uh, doing the turbulence modeling with realistic geometry is a, is a terrible work in terms of boundary condition. So there is a nice theory behind that, which is what published in science, but the real point is not the nice theory, the real point where this thing working is the hard work on the boundary conditions. Okay. So there's a company which is based in Boston and they're making a living out of that for 15 years now. It's a strange story, it's, it's not following the Gaussian curve in America because as I understand spin-off companies either they get very rich in a few years or they are bust. This is more of a new European story. They keep going, but as far as I understand, they are not super rich. So they're making good money, but it's not you know, a Google kind of story. Uh, uh, well, that's a calculation I did years ago with a good user teaching student. The idea is just to say that uh, I will explain that in my <coughs> lecture tomorrow. How to put uh, external forces into the fluid? Uh, this external force could be a magnetic field, could be a ferrofluid interaction, and this is a droplet which has undergone very strange deformation, as you see. And this went, in fact, in the kaleidoscope of theory a few years ago. And the nice thing about it is that you can generate very complex shapes just by modifying a few lines in the cone. That's another beauty of the method. But I will come to that lecture tomorrow. Uh, another application, just to show you the flexibility of the method, you can go down to nanometers, and for quite a number of years, in, together with Steve Caxias in Harvard, we have been using that response to study translation across the nanopore. Here I'm cheating, uh, you are not really taking into account the chemical structure of DNA, that would not be realistic. What we did, we took a, an anonymous polymer, so to say, and the polymer was uh, just interacting through Lennard Jones plus uh, spring, springs. And we used the lattice Boltzmann to model the solvent, which would be water, around the molecule, and to take into account the fact of either dynamic interaction, sorry, either dynamic correlation, to be more precise, and 
literally a zero range number on the motion of the motion of the polymer. And amazingly, uh, even though there is no flow at all, the, 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 the fact that this polymer is kind of dragging the molecule <coughs> around, so there are sort of nano vortices. It's, it's a little bit of exaggeration nano vortices, but there is some coherence in the solvent induced by the molecule, and this coherence effect is affecting the time it takes for the molecule to transfer. Why I'm saying, I mean, that will be again another seminar. I have several presentations on this, but the point I want to make is that you can bring the lattice bottom down to the nanometer, and you should immediately react against that, because in a nanometer, how many molecules do you have in a nanometer of water? I know that by art because I asked myself the question back then. You have 27, basically. The average distance is about 0.3 nanometers. <laughs> so you have to say that you describe the distribution function out of the system with 27 molecules. It's a little bit far-fetched, but if you think that you are also averaging time, it's OK. <coughs> But if you want to do that, then you have to modify the lattice Boltzmann and to put some fluctuation to the, to the Boltzmann curve. So this is done with a fluctuating lattice Boltzmann. I will not talk about that because it's, it's rather involved, but just I want to, to give you the flavor. So you can bring, you can go from cars <coughs> to uh, nanofluids, provided, of course, you are not forgetting the basic physics. And here, <coughs> the basic physics tells you that you should put fluctuation in the system. And the credit for uh, putting the fluctuation in the, in the lattice Boltzmann should go to Tony Ladd, who has uh, contributed really very important work in this direction. These are colloids, I mean, moving objects in, into the slow flows. But this is rather complicated. Uh, in the codes and the it's not uh, true. Uh, things which are doing very recently, uh, I have movies of that, but I should just load the number five. Uh, what we are doing here is this is basically a sort of foam, as you see. So this is uh, dense liquid <coughs> surrounded by gas or vapor, if you want. And what we are studying here is the rheology of these complex flows. So this is soft glassy flows. Uh, reality means that, for instance, if you uh, shear this flow, in fact, what we do, we put Kolmogorov flows. We put sinus, and we are pushing this way here and this way here. And uh, depending on the interaction between the fluid, and the interaction, at this I will show you tomorrow, can be extremely simple. We just put a fraction on the first lattice shell and repulsion on the second. It's a very simple lattice potential, but the competition between attraction and repulsion gives rise to an incredibly rich phenomenology and slow time relaxation, uh, uh, super immense viscosity, many phenomena that people are seeing in fact in soft glassy material. And uh, for instance, what we see here in this uh, situation, the fluid will be blocked, it will not flow. Okay? And essentially, it doesn't flow because, because these belts, somehow, you have just like a cage, so the molecules are impinging onto this belt, but they don't <coughs> break it. And if they don't break it, the interaction between the belts is such that they build up an effective viscosity which blocks off the fluid. But if you wait long enough, so the fluid this, when the, the line here is close to the green, the fluid, this is kind of fluidity of the system. But if you wait long enough, every now and then, tuck, you would wake up and start to flow again. Because for some reason, which you cannot really predict, <coughs> there is no way the system is so complicated, sometimes these uh, belts are broken, and then you start to flow. When it flows, you see the belts disappear. This reminds me a lot of your uh, real world in physics, in the, in the so called uh, dispersion interaction. The interaction between these two belts, which is called this joint interaction, is really critical. I mean, the way these two fields interact when they get very close together is something very subtle, which goes beyond aerodynamics, but really dictates in the end the full reality of the system, because it is the interaction between these fields which determines whether you start to flow again or not. 
this is this is just ongoing work. We're doing this uh, these days. So just to show you, sorry, is this a kind of phase transition? No, uh, no, it's not a phase transition. It's close to. In fact, I should be more detailed. What we are doing here, we are running two fluids. It's a mixture, okay? And the two fluids A and B, and this is the density of just one of them. Uh, when you see blue, it means that you have fluid A, and fluid B is basically zero because uh, there is a repulsion between the two. So it's not a phase transition. Uh, it's a mixture, and the mixture is such that A and B repel each other. So if I have A, I cannot have B. But A and A can, and B and B, uh, attract on the first shell and repel on the second shell. It's complicated. Uh, but uh, we did the mixture because we know that in the, in the glass former liquids, there are magic numbers for the equation uh, for the density of the two <coughs> fluid, such that you would avoid crystallization, you would go into the glassy system and <coughs> you would down. So that's why we did the two species. Right, I mean, part about phase transition because it's going to remind that. Yes, no, no, phase transition is a major... transition to the temperature, for example. Absolutely correct. I mean, I should have put a picture of phase transition because flows with phase transition is the major mainstream of that. I'm going to cover that tomorrow. The two major mainstreams are, uh, in complex fluids, are certain flows with phase transition, so bubbles, droplets, and things like this, and more and more so colloids. So complex flow. Things where really none is thought would, would be really hard to to solve in the first place, but sometimes you don't even know what the aerodynamic equation look like for this complex flow. Okay? And again, just to show you uh, the kind of spectrum of because that the calculation was mentioned before. So this is a artery of uh, which was taken from a big fat this is from a dead person. It comes from the Brighton hospital. It's made and uh, there is a, a lot of work to digitize the data which come out from the medical procedures. And you don't see it right here, but uh, the peculiarity of our approach is the code which ran on two kilometer cores, it's the newest um, uh, Here we have, in fact, this will go up, and we have the red cells explicitly accounted. So it's a granular flow. But these are supposed to be <coughs> blood cells. They're idealizations of the blood cells. But running, uh, in fact, in this case, we have about 200 million um, solid bodies representing the blood cell. Running them in such a geometry is, I don't know, any other uh, application of kind of that. Unfortunately, this is not very appealing to the physicists. <coughs> When we submitted this paper to PRL, we were rejected badly. <laughs> and uh, making uh, this uh, sexy for the medicals is not <coughs> easy either. So lately, although I'm very proud of this application, I develop a kind of cynic attitude because when you try to do to be really interdisciplinary, I mean, for sure, for sure. I mean, trying to do something which is a, uh, can be brought to fruition to medical doctors. It can be very rewarding on the social point of view, but if you want to increase your academic record with eyebrows publication, it's not really the best way to go, at least in my experience. So I was a little bit disappointed in that respect. <coughs> from the social point of view, this thing is going to be useful. I'm pretty sure it will. In 20 years from now, medical doctor will be even before that. Did, did, did the masters the artery respond to the flow, so do you have uh, compliance? Yeah. No. Yeah. So, it so maybe it was Charlie Peskin who injected the flow. Well, there were three or three. None of them was <laughs> just so less. Well, I mean, you know, so so they they use the much time method. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, frankly speaking, I mean, again, that would be another talk. The issue here was to see what the uh, uh, shear stress on the wall is, because this is really crucial to uh, trigger certain responses on the epithelial cells. I mean, that's 
that's it. Uh, there is a strong correlation with uh, uh, atherosclerosis. The medical doctor recommends that. So having an accurate description of the shear near the wall is important, and for that type of <coughs> pathology, the wall compliance is not that good. That's what the medical doctors told us. But of course, I mean, the heart is here, and the heart is pumping, so we should do it. We are doing that, but the compliance is it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. No, so this gives you more or less an idea of the flexibility of the matter. And uh, if there are questions, I would be very happy to take them. And if not, uh, I'm afraid today uh, that I, I'm going to explain the second effect generation of other thoughts. Of course, there are plenty of variants of that. Most of them are just citing the three events which we have and were really adding substantially to the subject. And they are, in fact, uh, out of the eye, lapis balls, and uh, the way maternal applied mathematician would do it. Remember my first slide, there were three ways to lapis balls. The physicist, which we saw, then reverse engineering, which is what we did. The design of the slope from based on the stops. And there is the peer to peer, how to show, showing that lattice Boltzmann is, after all, a discretized king of Boltzmann. That is almost a truism, but it's useful. It's a useful truism. Then there is the story of the old wine in a new bottle, which is a nasty statement. The multiple time relaxation is a new name for the scattering matrix, but it's more than a new name. It's actually different. <coughs> And a group of people picked this up very heavily, and they have been very aggressive, too much more you know, on, on uh, pushing for this, but there are some merits, so I will just touch very briefly on that. And then I want to give you a flavor for the entropic method, which is not very popular, less than it would deserve, um, but it's really, to me, this is the best of this point on the market. Uh, best means that is the one which gives you the highest numerical stability, for sure. So this should be of interest of, uh, for people who really want to push the Reynolds number as high as possible on that given uh, balance. If you do uh, flow in Paris media, you don't bother about the topic. If you want to do uh, fully developed turbulence, then you better take a look at that. Unfortunately, um, the early papers uh, are rather involved, they are pretty mathematical, and people didn't pick them up. But this is something worth uh, looking at. And a lot of the students I've been talking to, are uh, you, yes, we discussed that, and it's a fairly common issue that, all the more so that uh, one of the major uh, developers of this is in India. So, they have an easy, yeah. So, ah, uh, yeah, well, this, that's just a joke. I'm not a soccer fan. Not, in fact, I'm rather annoyed with soccer. We got so many soccer in Egypt. It's just brain, brainwashing. But nevertheless, when, when Italy won, it was, and it was in Berlin, by the way. I saw the, I saw the, this is it. I, you see the pool, the, the, the vehicle which was moving, the, which was transporting the Italian team to the stadium in Berlin. Just by chance. And, um, the, that's only a joke. Yeah, the point, the question I asked <coughs> is the ball, if I have to play soccer with the platonic solid, uh, my observation was that I need much more than just for so that I saw to because if I try to play soccer with something like, we have basically 19 speeds in high dimension, you have something like that. If you try to play soccer with that, that is just pressure less, right? So the message here is that soccer is much more demanding than fluid dynamics because fluid dynamics will stop basically. But I think soccer you have to do it better. I think there is this, uh, the, the, foot, the soccer ball is some uh, fullerene related yeah. solid. Yeah. So that's, that's just a joke to start the idea that nature has been smiling to us just with a low requirement for symmetry for hydrodynamics. Otherwise, all of this game is just Okay, this uh, boundary condition, of course, is the full story, but these are usually described when I give long courses and I show the code, which I could do if you like, but then for a kind of hand-on session. 
it's very useful to see the code and, and run it. And that's I usually do when I give longer lecture, at least you know, 10 hours course or something like that. But if you're interested in that, I have a little warm up code which I can over. And, you always, and if you plan to do some work on that, it's both I strongly recommend you do that. Just do it once. You know. So just let me know. But for a week, that would be too much. So again, another salary, but by now I already told you everything. So you have I'm going to make it myself. This is just enough. So, no you are you. The screen. So, in fact, there is a way of putting things in a catchy way, say that the nonlinearity is local and the non locality is linear in Lattice Box. So, in kinetic theory, not in Lattice Box. Whereas in hydrodynamics or in any hydrodynamic formalism, they just couple you, you, and, and drop. And disentangling that is very important. Okay, that I forgot to say. I mean, we don't have exact computing, that's right. But this operation, the streaming is still exact. <coughs> when I'm in lattice Boltzmann and I say that I have probability 0.7 of moving left, when I move left, 0.7 goes from here to here, perfectly preserved. So the streaming still is exact. Okay? That's why it's not just yet an application scheme. And as far as the collision are concerned, they are not exact, but nevertheless, since they are built upon the notion that they should conserve mass momentum and energy, you have conservation of two machine round off, which is pretty good. Okay? It's not perfect. So you will have more. But it's pretty smart. And that really reflects in the property of the scheme, which is, as Steve Orsak like to call it, is an anti-spectral method because it's low accuracy. That is what is at best second law. So can people can just nose up to a scheme, you know, if you are an applied mathematician, uh, the true theorems about convergence, uh, second law. But never forget that exponents are important, okay? Scaling exponents are important, but coefficients are important too. And the coefficients in front of the second law are pretty small. To the point that you can even beat, you easily beat, actually. Uh, find a different schemes which have higher order accuracy just because the upfront coefficients are much, much smaller due to these and this. It's very important. So it's a low order, but it's a very powerful low order scheme. These are commented, these are commented, this is the reason, that's one of the major reasons of success of this world, so that you can code up new physics. So the ratio between new <coughs> physics you get and Coding effort is, is like almost a phase transition. Then you touch a little bit of the code and you get entirely new physics, like flows with phase transitions. Colloids, you have to touch the code scheme. But for flows with phase transition, I promise you have 20 lines of code, easy lines of code, and you get a new one. That's again due to the beauty of the kinetic theory formula. But these are what you tomorrow. So any question at this point? No, on some points I'm insisting maybe too much, but these are the points which might be the present the take home message regardless of um, the details. So any question? Please not present. Okay, if not, then we become boring again. Because I have to move to the second lecture, which is more mathematical. Uh, but uh, it has to be given, so I'm going to Yes. So I'm going to talk this branch. Okay. I've illustrated a little bit this way. <coughs> so I'm talking this branch, and I will tell you a little bit about the time which was committed when we did reverse engineering. And we were lucky enough that we were forgiven for free. But by doing, by reversing gallery of going from year to year, we forgot about the second principle of thermodynamics, and we were forgiven. Very lucky. Very lucky. Uh, and the entropic method, in fact, one of the major merits of the entropic method was to explain why we were forgiven. <coughs> So, let me, so, let me, so, 
How many of you do you know about the mid expansion? I assume that if you took a course on quantum mechanics, you should know what the mid is. Oh, I see. Do you know what the mid is? So, I have to be very pedagogical. Let me try. So now the question is, I show you that I show you a couple of lattices. You saw the hexagonal, which we don't use. The lattice which is by far most used in 2D is this one. It is called VQQ9 for reasons which appear totally mysterious, <laughs> but they tell the system behind. D is easy, dimension 2. But D doesn't mean dimension. Q is impossible for you to grasp. And, uh, but it means two dimension, nine speeds. Huh? Zero, one, I usually number them like this, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay? So, D means Dumier and Q means Kian. I, knowing Dumier, I doubt he likes that. <laughs> uh, I don't know who invented that, probably not. Kian was Dumier's student uh, back then. They are the authors of the most cited paper, the one which put up the VGK and computed the equilibrium systematically. But everybody knows that, like, the, some people don't like that, and they call it, if I'm not mistaken, E2 and 9, dimension and velocity. But, I mean, if you see this, now you know what it is. Uh, no matter what, there is one thing in this lattice that should, should surprise you. <coughs> Much surprise um, Think in this term. Yeah, one particle which has zero energy. So I define the energy as mass is 1, ci squared, and just allow me the privilege of forgetting about the fact of okay. So we can ci squared. So we, here we have a particle with energy 1, with energy 0, sorry. Then we have four particles with energy 1, and we have another four is energy 2, the diameter. This would not be fit for lattice gas because one of the constraints in the lattice gas is that all the speeds are the same. That was essential in the early days when people wanted to work with occupation state rather on the 0 and 1 and, and also the velocity of the 0 and 1. That is why on this constraint, when you go to 3D, they couldn't find any balance. But if you allow, in fact, energy levels to be more than just 0 and 1, then you would find it. Okay? So in the lattice Boltzmann, we don't have this constraint anymore, because for us, Fi is anything between 0 and 1, so it doesn't need to be a Fermat, 0 or 1. And so it was very easy to find many more lattices, <coughs> which the isotropy constraint. Okay? But the, you might ask, okay, where do I get this uh, velocity from? I told you about symmetry requirements, but is that enough to, in fact, pin down the exact lattice? It is and it is <coughs> not, but it was very heuristically found. Now, people realize that there is a very systematic way of identifying the discrete space, at least in certain cases. So the question is, in our game, we uh, identify the continuum velocity uh, in the set of discrete speed, and we call them population of five speed. And I, as I told you many, many times, we have to fulfill this uh, constraint. Okay. Here, uh, this slot in the notation, this is a tensor version of two hours. Okay, then people came in '96. And they realized the nice thing, that in the end we owe a big debt to Mr. Friedrich Gauss because <coughs> now I'm taking a language more of statistical physicist when you sample, in fact, the space. Uh, so I try to connotate that in both as a sampling technique. So we are sampling uh, frequent events, actually. That would be the terminology in, in terms of statistical 
So basically, we have a real gas, and we fill the molecules can go up and down wherever they want, and with energy not constrained to these hours should be very long, and the energy could be for a normal atheistic fluid between zero and infinity. In principle. And what we do is just freeze this molecule along given direction, right? Or if you want to use again another kind of language, you could say that you coarse grain the molecules, the velocity space, and uh, so that all I mean, there could be, you could think of a cone of possible velocity around any of these two speeds. And all molecules which are in that cone just get frozen around this point. So for condensation. So who gives us the magic speeds? Well, here comes the reprojection. So if you are a kinetic theorist, you say, fine, well, let's take this equation, and now I put the force, but forget about the force. <coughs> and let's be formal. So I'm trying to be very pedagogical for those who have never seen that. If you have taken a course in kinetic theory, you have seen that. If you have done quantum mechanics, you have seen that as well, but in different form. So let me try to be fully pedagogical. Should I stop, John? No, you should finish this. Okay. I will not finish it. That will take me 15 minutes. So let's do the let, let's stop at 11.30. Just give the introduction and then come back. Everybody should agree, and there is no, uh, I would say, no uh, question about that, and that if I have a function of space, velocity, and time, I can always expand this function. In a, this is called basis function, so I'm expanding the velocity space. This is the basis of velocity space, and the mid polynomials are suitable basis. And this fk are basically the coefficient of the expansion. I'm just, just like, like having a vector in a space with an infinite number of dimensions. I'm sure some of them, theoretical physicists, for sure, are seen. And then I have to put for convenience some prefactor units away. And this prefactor has exactly the form of the Maxwell distribution. That's not the coincidence. Okay. Now, it so happens that if I do that, okay, and if these polynomials have this nice property, which of course I missed here because this is HK and this is HL, they are orthogonal. So if I do this scalar product, you can solve this mistake, it should be L. Unless the two indices are the same, I get zero, which is orthogonal. This is trivial for most of you, but for those who have never seen okay. If this is an orthogonal basis, in fact, normalized to one, then it's easy to see that I get my coefficient by just projecting, so to use the proper language, the uh, distribution function upon the kth vector. You can see that for those who have never seen it as a the function is just like a vector and it would be the basis h1 and h2, okay? And by the time I do this integration, which you could think as a scalar problem of two vectors, so h, k is here. What I'm doing, I'm just computing the projection over the case axis, except that this is not <coughs> geometric plane, this is a so-called functional space. Okay? But the language might be a little bit weird, but it's very weird. Okay? Please note one important thing. Suppose I tell you, as it is in fact the case, that H0 is just uh, 1, okay? When I do this, you get something that you are supposed to know. I will ask you. Now you're always in the front. <laughs> just you, in fact. <laughs> if I tell you that H0 is 1, what is the physical meaning of what is it? Who is F0? something you should know by right. The same. What is it? No, no, I'm asking you a specific question. I'm integrating the distribution function. If this is one, I'm just doing the integral over all possible speeds. I'm doing f x and 
speech and it's given to points in space. And in time, it's just standing on the whole possible speed. I'm getting a very well known hydrodynamic properties, which is Chanel? The fluid density. So now I'm trying to get down to Earth. This is a very abstract notation, but for each of these integers, there is a specific number. <coughs> Some of them has a, has a very, very well defined meaning. So when I am projecting, I'm using the mathematician language, the distribution function of <coughs> the zeroth order limit, say this one, I tell you that the zeroth order limit is one. What I get as a coefficient is the fluid density. So this is a way from going from so-called phase space. Phase space is space and velocity space, double dimension. When I want to recover hydrodynamics, I have to project along the velocity space because hydrodynamics doesn't know about velocity. So going from kinetic theory to hydrodynamics always involves some form of integration of velocity space, which is called projection. Once again, now I tell you that the first limit by chance is V. It is V. What am I getting? And we have to be careful. You should know that as well. Yesterday I told you, well, we are moving fast. I mean, you, 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 are, you can definitely be okay. FDV is the fluid density. FBDV is, uh, I think, the vectors. So <coughs> the mid space doesn't come up to the blue. It is a mathematical structure which is just perfectly well suited to formalize the passage from kinetic theory to hydrodynamics. And I can be even more generous and go over to the second order, which happens to be almost v square. It's v square minus. If I tell you that h2 is v square. What you get is no. Then, then I'm very bad. You should know. Okay. What is this? This is the energy that I have in my fluid. In fact, it has a component which is the mechanical motion plus the <coughs> some thermal energy. Okay. okay. So. Just to say that the first three are meet, in fact they are five because that the velocity is a vector. So the first five are meet for the numbers have a very, very concrete meaning. They give me the density, the velocity, and the energy of the fluid. Okay? So I have a five-dimensional space. I don't know, I think put three of them here. Okay? It's a weird notation. So when I project over zero, I get the coefficient is a density. When I project over one, two, three, the coefficient are ux, uy, uz. And when I project over four, I get the fluid energy. Okay? It's an abstract representation, but it's very complete. So the mid space is the mathematical space where you should, in fact, formulate rigorously the transition from kinetic theory to hydrodynamics. The mathematicians know that very well for long. But people who didn't do kinetic theory, and many theoretical physicists who don't do kinetic theory, need to go on the stage for years. Uh, usually they get this very fast because it reminds quantum mechanics, but just because of that, not because they did kinetic theory. So if you have an excuse if this sounds weird to you. But is that clear? The next limits are much less <coughs> So I will spare you that. And with that, I take a little break so that you can ponder on the new yeah, so, uh, Just five minutes to get a copy.